joining us yeah I'm so happy to be here frigid frigid day right <laughs> yes we're in New York and we're frozen right and you are in Chicago Illinois so tell us how that's going <laughs> so we hadn't really had winter yet until this weekend which is weird because normally winter starts in like November. around Thanksgiving <laughs> yes. and that didn't happen this year and we just got like a big snowstorm this weekend so it's freezing and I feel like we're all just like out of practice so oh, yes so you got a lot of snow yes we yeah got snow, thank god yeah New Jersey got snow I think Long Island got depended where in uh, New York metro area but we did it but it's freezing. I almost prefer the snow if it were less cold. <laughs> I know. It's like, just make it worth it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The wind is what's torture. So for anybody who doesn't know Allie, she's on Instagram as Misbehavior, and I'm going to give the audience a little bit of a bio on you. Allie Szynski has been a special education educator for about eight years now, or is it longer? Um, at this point, it's probably nine, but I mean, who's counting? So okay. <laughs> I never know how long we've been working either. I know. I always say this. The years just blend together. They do. <laughs> like, it's been more than one. Right. Um, <laughs> so, I have my C's now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not real now. <laughs> so Allie's mom was actually a special education teacher for 25 years. So maybe it's like a family trait. Mm -hmm. uh, her undergrad degree is in special education and she has her master's degree in behavior and multiple disabilities. Allie taught children with moderate to severe intellectual disabilities and autism for six years in an inner city school district. Um, she did move and she started working in a public school, public district, no, no, sorry, working at a public therapy day school for children with primary disability of uh, education, emotional behavior disorder. But now she currently works for a nonprofit, right? Uh, yes. Yes. As a educational consultant, so you're not in the classroom currently. Right. Um, and then, so many of her students have in the past had mild intellectual disabilities and are on the autism spectrum, in addition to their main challenge of behavior. Um, she absolutely loves her job because she knows she makes a difference every day and not everyone can do this job, but Allie knows that she can do it well. And that's my favorite part of this bio. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's and what it, I have to say it to that. Means, it, it means, you know, I think it's important to have confidence in yourself mm -hmm. because also like we work in such a fragile aspect of education where right. people are going to you for help and answers and if you don't have faith in yourself like that person's gonna feel lost right or like maybe their issue is too challenging I never want any parent to think like oh this like like my kid or my situation is something that they haven't seen before you know? right or that they don't have the experience to even know how to contribute to this conversation about it right in a, in a confident manner right you have to be able to at least pretend like you know what you're doing right, right you yeah. actually do right <laughs> and even if you've had like a similar but not because everyone is so different right if, uh you've had experience with something similar like that well you could say like oh this is what worked in the past and this one didn't so now you can like troubleshoot together and individualize your approach right you have a baseline at least right so, so what is your specific title are you a behaviorist or what I wish. Um, so a lot of people ask me like, so what do you consult in? And really what I'm doing right now is just consulting in special education. But because my passion and my experience is more behavior focused, I take on more of the behavior cases. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I'm doing a little bit of everything. So that's not exclusive to that. Um, so I don't have a BCBA, which a lot of people always ask me. Um, my master's degree really covered almost everything that 
a BCBA program would, or an ABA program, I should say, because I obviously didn't and cannot sit for the boards. But since it was not um, coded for like being able to sit for the boards, I can't do that. Like the programs, either you get in Illinois, it's called Learning Behavior Specialist Two, which is a really silly and way right. too long of a title. Yeah. And um, so you can either get that, or you can sit for your. Um, or you can like have to take that those courses and have them be ABA courses, if that makes sense. You have to go one way or the other. So when I got my master's, I thought, I don't really think I need a BCBA. Now I kind of wish that I had done that, but I mean, well, I have the same knowledge, so it's fine. <laughs> right. Never too late, you know. And right. Or just go do it. Yeah, just do it. If that's what you want to do, just do it. So. But you all, you said that like you feel like uh, you don't really need that extra. It would just be like another... Yeah more letters next to your name a lot of letters which is always fun but um which you guys know all about adding letters to your name right that's yeah. like right that's a thing um mm -hmm. but additionally i feel like i don't know that i would be learning anything that i don't already have except it would be great to learn with new people and from new professors so that's always interesting and right. it would open up some job opportunities like if i ever wanted to just specifically work like on behavior in like a clinic or something, mm -hmm. I would think that most really reputable clinics would be looking for a BCBA. So kind of depends on what I want to do in the future. Yeah. Right. And you have plenty of time to decide. I yeah. do. Take it as it comes. You know? Right. Maybe as right. of right now, you're not. For lots of time. Yeah. That's good. So awesome. our show is called SLP's Wine and Cheese. Um, but I went to a brunch yesterday at noon. And then we just kept staying out. So, like, I don't need, I don't require any more wine. Fair. Right. I was with Deb, too. We linked yes. up at Ford's Ahead. <laughs> um, she doesn't require any more no, wine. because I had all the wine yesterday. Right, which was good. Because so, yeah. yeah. wine is healthy. But yeah. you're also, and you were safe. You're on vacation. Right, <laughs> yeah. It's your it's weekend. We were, like, right. the old ladies in the bar dancing at 8.30. We're, like, lit at 8.30. <laughs> By the time you got there. Oh, by the time I got there. Right. <laughs> like yeah, the wine had already started before you. Well, I was so. done. I, um, In your defense, you went to brunch, though. You I know, started I started early. at noon. That's, so if we want to talk about what I had yesterday, well, I started off with some Prosecco, eased my way into some right. white wine, transitioned to uh, some Lagunitas. Right, so, uh, so uh, drink them drink or sink them? Oh, I vote drink them, just not right now. Right, yes. Right. Yeah. I feel because it's so cold, I'm feeling like slight, slight uh, cold coming on. So I said, let me stop. Let me have some tea. So we're drinking tea. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. But what are you drinking, Allie? I'm drinking my favorite wine, which is just a Pinot Grigio. Oh, nice. lovely. Great. I'm a white wine drinker. Um, this is cupcake wine, you know, not the finest, but really tasty. I right know that now. wine. Yeah. It's good, right? I mean, it's like, it's a good standby. You know? It is. Yeah. I, I, I like their labels. Yeah, I like you. Yeah. And that. It's pretty. Yeah. I like that wine when you're going to like a house party. You're like, look, it's a cupcake wine, you know? Yeah, it's like, like it's so cute. Right. Yeah. Even though you're like, it was like $11, but it's fine. Right. Yeah. It tastes good. Yeah, it's good to bring places. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, so, so thanks for covering the wine. Yes. Yeah. So tonight. do you vote to drink that wine or sink it? Drink it. Definitely drink I'm it. a fan. Yeah. I yeah. love the cupcake. I'd recommend it. Time and time again. Right. Yes. Yeah, All it's right. good. Perfect. So Maria made a game. Yes. I made a quick little game. It's uh, called This or That. We usually give it to our guests. And uh, it's quick. And, you know, just try not to worry or overthink any of the questions. Okay. Okay. All right. Ready? Dog or cat? Dog. Deep dish or thin crust pizza? Deep dish. <laughs> Scrambled or boiled eggs? Boiled. Instagram or Facebook? Instagram. Skiing or ice skating? Ice skating. Beach or hiking? Hiking. White wine or red wine? White. Yeah, you're right. Mozzarella <laughs> or provolone? I, didn't, I missed that one. Say it again. Oh, mozzarella or provolone? Oh, provolone. Okay. Singing or dancing? Dancing. Hamburger or taco? Taco. Okay. And then I have a bonus question. Since you're Ooh. in fish, yes. Place, what's your favorite topping? For my taco? Top oh no, for your pizza. Oh my pizza. I was like tacos. I could just yeah, keep oh, going. talk about that. Pizza. Um I like pepperoni and black olives. 
Okay. Oh, that's a good combo. That's a good combo. Mm -hmm. Really so salty. I like yeah. sodium. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like pepperoni and onion the most. Okay. I'm, yeah. I guess I'm boring. I just like cheese. So really? I feel like sometimes the toppings take away from the cheesiness, and I like cheese. No, I get that. Yeah. Sometimes I, I like a classic cheese. Thank you. I'm classic. You know, I'm just classic. Yeah, it's just really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't like any sort of topping that's like a vegetable only because it's, it's watery and it like weighs down the pizza and it makes um, it crispy and I just don't like that at all. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Okay, so I have a couple questions. So uh, we're going to talk about behavior and I was wondering, um, were you a well-behaved kid, mm. Allie? So at home, no, but at school, yes, which really freaked out my parents. So, yeah. So what did you do at home that was not so? Great? I was a very, very, very difficult, like, young child to parent. I just very strong-headed and would, like, I, and, and then I would do things like bite my parents and my brother and, like, and they would, like, do everything in the world, like, put soap in my mouth and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't care. Yeah. They try to put me in timeout and I wouldn't like bend and sit in the chair and I was wow. just I was a treat. Look at that. Yeah. So and here we are. <laughs> you're the youngest? I am the youngest. I have an older brother. I'm the youngest too. I wonder if younger children are more inclined to challenging behavior. So I was about to ask, so were you a good kid or a bad kid? Uh, I was very good in school. Uh, I was all right, I guess, at home. I mean, I wasn't like a perfect kid. I mean, who is? But me and my brother fought a lot, and I always would just like blame it on him. Like, he did it, even though, meanwhile, I was like the instigator. Oh. Right, yes, I was very <laughs> sneaky. But my parents knew I was sneaky, so. Oh, that's good. Yes. I always got in trouble everywhere <laughs> I was. I talked too much, I broke everything, I lost everything, I didn't pay attention, I didn't clean up, I didn't, uh, I made a mess. And I would do like silly things, like I would like dig in the dirt and then walk in the house and make it, dis and not even realize that I. I wasn't doing it to be bad, but I was definitely like just in another world. Still am. Right. Um, right. All right. So and now I have some some really meaty questions I'd like to ask you about behavior specifically. Sure. So, I've noticed that a lot of behavior is affected by the way things are phrased when I'm working with kids. So do you have any go-to phrases that you like to use when you're working with children who are demonstrating challenging behavior? Yes, like some tried and true sayings that I always say. Um, one that, and my colleagues would always like laugh because I didn't realize how much I said it until like other adults would be like, oh, just like what Allie says. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I said it that often. Um, was always, I would always tell kids, thanks for sharing. Like they would say something to me that was maybe like inappropriate or they're trying to instigate something or that's, you know, how it presented itself. Right. And so I would say, thanks for sharing because it like acknowledges to them, like, I hear you, I'm not ignoring you. And I get that you have something to, you know, share with us, but it's not necessarily reinforcing whatever they're doing, right? It's not, and I'm not getting in a power struggle by telling them to stop cursing or being off topic or whatever they're choosing to do. And that's good. You acknowledge them. So you kind of gave them that like small little bit of attention that I think most of the life. Right. Often that's what they want. Right. Exactly. But, so I like that. I think I want to put that one in my back pocket for tomorrow. There you go. It's also good to use with some adults. Yes. Thanks, right. thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah. I would use that with some people who were like, your student in PE class just can't. I'm like, oh, wow. I, you know, I empathize. Thanks for sharing that with me. And then just walk away. Because you're like, hi. Right. right. What do you want? It sounds like a you problem, but I don't uh, know. Right. right. <laughs> I like this. I like to, so whenever kids are giving me a hard time, I will always be like, I have asked you many times to sit, and I see that you are not sitting, so that must mean that you don't want to move forward with whatever I have for whatever reward, and then they're like, oh, wait, yeah, I want that, so let me sit, right. but I'm never like, I don't like to be like, sit down, like, or right. like, speak like that, I just, I, I acknowledge that I have already told them. Because cause I, I took it from Frederick Douglass. Okay. In his speeches, he always repeats the same thing over and over again. And he, in one of his speeches, he was like, 
I don't have to tell you that slavery is wrong. You know slavery is wrong. Like, I don't have to tell you that everyone is equal. You know that. Like, that's what he's saying to the audience. So I like to tell the kids, I'm like, you know the right thing to do. I don't have to tell you that you need to sit because you already know. And that's how I, that's, that's, that's my phrase. But in it, you're also telling them the, dir the direction again, just in case. Yeah. Like, yeah. Somehow we miss that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any? I like visuals again. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Always um, a key. Right. Yeah. Um, but is, is it specifically for not sitting? Just anything. Yeah. Your for, I'm going to go with the sitting, but I like to just pair it with the visual or mm -hmm. um, the token board and just like, what are you earning? Like just remind them what they're earning right yeah eyes on the prize kind of thing right yeah so i don't go into that much of a tangent as deb but i'm just like let's just oh, yeah, yeah no i like, berate them. right yeah <laughs> I, I, like you will i will not stop talking very right. neutral tone without any emotion but i will keep going until they're like please for the love of god right yeah I like to conserve my voice, and I always feel like sometimes less is more, so I'm just like, this is what you have to do, you know it, let's work for what you want, you know, so I spin it on, like, what do you want, what are you working for, so just putting it back on them, like, you're the one who's not earning, I used right. that once with someone else, like, I was like, I'm gonna get the candy, <laughs> like, right, are yeah. you gonna earn candy, I don't know, let's see, <laughs> So you want to go into yeah, the, so our next question? The next question we have is, so you talk a lot about essential oils on Instagram. Um, can you describe maybe three essential oils that you think are essential for behavior management? Yeah, I love essential oils. It's my, it's sort of a, a newish thing for me, but once I went down the rabbit hole, I like couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. um, so one that I really can't live without for myself and for the kids is lavender oil, which you can get, I mean, anywhere essentially. I have like a favorite brand, but there's many different options for lavender or anything. Um, it's really soothing. So that's helpful for, I mean, many situations. <gasps> there you go. Yeah, I got like lavender oil right now. Yeah. Yeah. Deb and I both love lavender and I've been yeah. using it actually, I guess maybe in preparation for your episode. So. <laughs> I brought my diffuser to uh, work as well, and I started. Oh, so yeah, see, I love it at work. Yes. And so I would use it, um, so I had a necklace that I would always wear. It was like, sort of like, I'd put it on with my lanyard, because I always had to carry my keys, like on a lanyard. We had a school one we had to wear. So I had this long necklace that is like a, it's called a diffuser necklace, and it's like a big, it almost looks like a locket, and uh -huh. it has a piece of almost like felt in it, and it comes with several different pieces, and you can put some of the oil on it. So I got that because the kids would always want to be like, oh, what do you have? And so, like, what does it smell like? You know, and I could lift it up and have them smell it. And it really helps with deep breathing, too. Like, right, yeah. you have to take a really deep breath and inhale and then do a big exhale in order for, like, to feel calmer and to really smell it, you know, and they liked that. But then it also helps with, like, I'm teaching you what it is to actually take a deep breath. Yeah. And it's, like, helping them actually do it. Because sometimes when you ask, they're like, I'm not doing that, you know. Right. But when it has more of a purpose, what it means. Right. 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 So, um, lavender is great with that. And then also using it like topically, I always put it on my feet before I go to bed. I'm a terrible sleeper. So that helps me. Wow. Um, Good idea. Yeah. Uh, also I love peppermint oil because a lot of our kids don't sleep. Like they're the worst sleepers. Yeah. And that's a lot of the time I think why they're so irritable sometimes, especially like when they first come to school, it's like, at some point they fell asleep because they probably woke up in the morning. So they had to be asleep for some amount of time and then got dragged out of bed after two, three hours of sleep for a million and 10 reasons probably. And then came to school and now they're irritable. And so peppermint like really wakes you up. So I like that one for the kids too. Um, and then there's an oil from young living that I really like. It's like their a specific one from theirs is called stress away. I love stress away. Yeah. So yeah. I was having a stressful day and uh, I came over to Deb's house and she was like, hold on. And she put the stress away and like, <laughs> I was dodging on my temples. And that temples, was, oh. right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Like yeah. Deb is like stroking her jaw. Like I clench my teeth really oh. bad. And so I would have to do that too. Like when I, I get stressed or I put it on there. 
Yeah. I, like, I feel like sometimes I just wake up and I, my jaw, I lock jaw, I feel like, because I just must have been so stressed. You do, right. like, and you're like, exactly. you do like clench. You're yeah. a cluncher. Yeah. Now that you say it. I am too. Yeah. Um, but I think stress away kind of speaks for itself, but it right. smells really good in a diffuser too. So the kids are at least not like, what's that? They're like, Ooh, I like that, you know? And it just promotes like a good atmosphere. And then like, I would do that if I, especially if I had to stay after and like do a bunch of IEP stuff and I'm like, I just want to go home. You know, I have so much to do. And that's like sort of just a nice, like pick me up. So my school let us diffuse, but I know not every school does. So okay. my right. school does every classroom has a diffuser now just started after Christmas break. Really? Yeah. I love that. How cool. That's great. So it's like everything smells like a spa. Wow. Which I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I don't even smell this stuff anymore. <laughs> right. You're like, I don't even know which room smells like what anymore. That's but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I That's also really cool. Yeah. I like the peppermint oil as well for um, breathing in because it also creates sensation in the back of the throat. So like maybe for some kids who are not producing those speech sounds that are back there, it's going to increase sensation there and then perhaps like stimulate them to get them to produce that sound. Maybe. Wow. Maybe. That's like, really cool. I've never heard that. That's awesome. Just because it's like, there is like ideas where you like increase sensory input in order to trigger a motor response. Sure. Yeah. But who knows for sure. I don't know if there's a research study on it. Right. But right. I know for a fact, if I breathe in peppermint, I can now, like I have, I can feel the back of my throat because that's where it hits. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I just feel like it wakes me up and it reminds me of Christmas, so it puts me in a good mood. So, right. It wakes me up a lot. Like, I smell it and I'm like, oh, I'm wide awake. And it's a pleasant smell. It's not like a, like, off-putting smell. Right. So it's like, and it's familiar, like you said. Like, it's not anything too wild. So. Exactly. I like that one. Yeah. I, um, I work very closely with the occupational therapists at mm. my job, and they're very big obviously with sensory but they did so I just want to like mention it on the episode like disclaimer you have to really be careful with sense too because there are some students that are hypo or hypersensitive um so you definitely want to like consult with an OT or PT uh OT or the parent um get clear all of the above yeah yeah, all the above, um, make sure there's no, like, allergies or anything, so I still think that's, like, worth mentioning on this episode, right. yeah. so don't just go, like, picking all these essential oils and blame it on SLPs, wine, and cheese. Right. Um, you know, we uh, didn't even have wine today. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's just yeah. me, so. Yeah, so you, you're, you're on your own on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's our halfway point time. Okay. But yes, so then, as well. okay, if it's our halfway point, so right. we'll take a break there. We would like to let everyone know that this episode of SLP's Wine and Cheese is brought to you by SpeechTherapyPD.com. Right. Um, it is a 100% SLP owned company specializing in practical, engaging, evidence-based video and audio courses. There are more than 600 hours of CEU courses on demand and courses up to 15 hours that are 1.5 ASHA CEUs in length. Um, there's weekly live and interactive courses and it's home to pod courses such podcast, as podcasts yeah. like First Bite with Michelle L.W. Dawson. Who we had on our show as well. So definitely check out her podcast. It's excellent. Yeah. So also we have a lovely... Uh, Unlimited plus unlimited plan starting at $89 a year and you get $10 off with the code wine and you don't have to have yes. a, it's not case sensitive. So if you go to speech therapypd.com and you decide you want um, an unlimited plan for $89 a year, which is a great deal. You can get yeah. CEUs whenever you'd like just type in wine for your uh, coupon code and you'll get uh, $10 off. And I love going on speech therapy PD just like, for instance, if I'm about to see a client who's new, but all I know about them is perhaps their diagnosis, I can quickly listen to um, an yeah. audio yeah. course and on my drive to that location yeah. just to like get a refresher on like how that individual might present and what are some um, therapy yeah. techniques yeah. that I can evidence, use with them. Evidence-based therapy techniques. Right. Right. Yes. So, so yeah, that's speechtherapypd.com. Awesome. 
And then also for our halfway point, so we like to tell everyone um, where they can find us on the internet. Yes. So Allie, you can go first. Sure. So I have a blog, www.misbehaviorblog.com. And when you're there, you can click on all the links to find me on Facebook, which is Misbehavior Blog on Facebook, my Teachers Pay Teachers store, which is Allie Suzinski with Misbehavior, but I dare you to try to spell that. <laughs> um, and on Instagram, I'm underscore misbehavior. So I love chatting with people and I answer all of my messages. So feel free to come chat with me. Great. And we are SLP's Wine and Cheese pod underscore between each word. I'm Deborah Brooks, CCC SLP. And Instagram and Maria is Maria underscore Katsonis SLP. And don't forget to check out our Patreon because we have more videos on there and we have some poems that we're going to release and some good stuff. And so, bonus episodes. And bonus yes. episodes. So yes. check out our Patreon. Yes. And is that it? Is that all of our? Uh, oh, we have t-shirts. T-shirts. Blah yeah. blah blah. Yes, I'm wearing a turtleneck. Yeah, so, she's but. just gonna flap. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we have t-shirts available. There's not a ton left, but uh, reach out and we will get one in the mail to you. Yes. All right. So we'll pick up where where we left off. So we talked about the three essential oils: lavender, peppermint, and stress away. Um, where I gave my little disclaimer: make sure you're consulting with. Um, an occupational therapist, the parent, the teacher, wherever you're setting, uh, before using these essential oils. Um, cause I know a lot of them, you need like a carrier oil, right? So if you're not like putting right. them on their skin, maybe it's just like breathing it or diffusing it. So just to be mindful of that. Yeah. It's always good to just triple check and make sure that everybody's okay with everything in general yeah. before you do it, but especially with something that's a little unconventional like this one. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. How long have you been using essential oils? So I started probably like a year and a half ago, but I only had like a few. So I liked the ones I had, but I just hadn't really branched out. And you know, our jobs are stressful. And so the ones I had were working and I kept hearing that certain things help with stress. So I started getting more and more into it and just getting, and that was more as of recent. Um, just ordering more and more and now I'm sucked in so right. they work for me so Great. I'm I'm all in do you feel like they've yielded positive results in terms of behavior for the students too yeah and I think it's just something that um, is novel too which also just can be really helpful in many scenarios like it's just something novel and like something yeah. special like oh I'm feeling really upset and you know we're going through certain things that maybe they would you know, uh, would be helpful for them as a coping mechanism or a coping skill. And sometimes they honestly feel comfortable. Like, I just want to like smell something nice. Like, okay. You need a little sensory release. All right. Let's, you know, sometimes I'd even put some on like a tissue and hand it to them and they right. love that. So it's, and it's something comforting and you're thinking of them and giving them something special. So. Awesome. And like, also remember like scratch and sniff stickers were oh, so, always so popular. I have. I have. Yeah. And good markers are so popular. So, like, kids love smelling things. Right. Right. So, it's just, like, a good thing there. Okay. So, now, many SLPs, they struggle to accomplish speech therapy goals when the child is demonstrating challenging behaviors. I'm going to give you three different challenging behaviors, and then maybe you can provide us with a strategy of how you would combat that. Sure. Okay. So, the first would be, like, um, not participating. Somebody who is... Um, not motivated or somebody who is not engaged they're just they're refusing to participate right um i think with kids that are naturally typically ch like showing challenging behaviors regularly especially in like with speech you might not be with them an extended amount of time so you might not have like extended amount of time to relationship build which is also can be kind of tricky um so making relationship building a priority and building that into your schedule, which it doesn't always allow for that, but I think it's really important with, you know, kids that can be reluctant mm -hmm. and then making sure you know their interests. And then something that we would always say at my school was teach to and teach through their interests. Mm -hmm. So teach to it. So pick activities that you know are going to relate to their strengths. So maybe you're working on Arctic and Arctic goal, but they're really good and love board games. Okay, so let's make sure that they're playing a board game and we're just working on this goal as we're doing it. Right. And then knowing um, their interests, so then you can build that in. Like if they're obsessed with a character 
or some kind of movie that's like, okay, well, we're going to talk about these like social, you know, pieces after watching like clips from Elf. Like now we can pull things out and talk about, you know, because we know that they're obsessed with that's all they can think about is this movie right now or and they're refusing to do anything unless it has something to do with that. Well, you can sort of almost trick them into learning in the sense when you're making it something that has to do with them. It does take some like forward like thinking and planning. So that's not always the easiest. Mm -hmm. But that's important because a lot of times you see, we have students and they have like those restricted interests and we're like, Oh, we got to get away from the restricted interests. And like, yes, maybe we do, but not right now. So you have to like, at least get the door in and establish that rapport. And yeah, like for some kids, that's like a comfort zone. And you're yeah. like, if you're pulling that out, it's like, well, now you have nothing. Like, right. yeah. let's, let's work with what we have at first. And then we can sort of build the repertoire from there. Right. Exactly. And you can just try to add to their interest, not like, yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's like rude. Like, why are you going to take away someone's favorite toy? True. Right. Um, so my next behavior is going to be, so let's say we're in a mixed group of uh, three to four kids, and there's always like that ringleader kid who is just rallying everyone up and getting everybody off track and sidetracked. Maybe they're having like off topic remarks or they're doing too much giggling. So what would you do in that case? Right. So it sounds like obviously this kiddo likes to sort of be in charge. Um, so I would give them some ability to be in charge. I think with some things, we don't always see it as a strength. And if you sort of try to focus on it being like, okay, they have some leadership skills here, clearly, if they're able to be the Pied Piper and like get everybody to like do whatever they want to do. And right. everyone laughs at them and stuff. Okay, well, then we're gonna have, you know, Deb's gonna lead the group then. Okay, Deb. So here's like, who's gonna go first, you know, and you have them pass it out. And then you kind of take turns on who does it because you know, the rest of them are gonna get you know, right. sad about it, you know, I want to turn to lead and giving them some, sometimes when you give them a job or some type of ability to do that, it gets it out of their system a little bit. That's and right. Like, yeah. I know you like that. That's okay. Let's do it for a minute. And now sometimes it's going to have to be my turn to lead. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I like to do that. So if I, I have thinking in my head of one student in particular and whenever he is doing this, I'll be like, oh, you know what? I forgot to cross off yesterday's date on the calendar. Can you I, go cross that off? That's what me? I do. I get them moving. Like, all right, you're, you're, you're sitting here and you're causing too much. You know what? You're going to go to get this. You get the pencil. You get the glue. And that way mm -hmm. it gives them some, some movement, but also like. Yeah. And a task. You know, sometimes yeah. they just need something to do. Right. All right. Well, you could be my assistant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Right. There we go. And then the, <laughs> the last. Um, the last issue I'm going to provide to you is like irrational behavior. When the behavior does not uh, match the situation, maybe they're getting highly upset and they're crying or they're getting highly upset and they're angry and throwing things or something. When they right. have very high extreme behavior. Right. So I think it's also important to know that if a child's like dysregulated in an, especially in an extreme way, you're not ready. You're not going to get good data. You're not going to be able to make a breakthrough with speech sounds. Like it's not probably going to happen this session or this moment, you know, and that's okay. And this is, can still be a learning moment. And so kind of put that stuff aside and work with them on deescalating in whatever way that it is. And then I think the most important piece that people often feel like they don't have the time to do or just don't take the time to do, maybe it's both, I don't know, is making sure that after all is said and done, like even if your session's over and you had to drop them back off with their teacher and they're still dysregulated and you're like, I'm so sorry, I have to go pick up another kiddo. Right. Like, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, debrief with them later, like when they're not escalated and talk to them about it. Like, hey, what happened, you know? I, I really think that you looked upset and that was really hard and we had so many fun things to do and we didn't get to do them. How can I help you next time? Like, do you know what made you so upset and have like a debrief conversation? Uh -huh. And so. when you're able to do that, then you get some more information so you can, you know, make some informed decisions for the next time, you know, wow. so I can avoid this or I can provide something else prior to try to prevent these things from happening. But you think it's important to make sure that you do later on 
go to that child and acknowledge the situation. Yeah, I think when we ignore it, it's just like, it's going to happen again, probably. Right. And you never like, they could be really mad at you about the way that you handled something, or maybe you said something and you didn't know that that triggered them, or there could be a million reasons and you need to clear the air, or maybe they hurt you during that time. And you're like, Hey, you know, like, I need you to know that this happened and that's okay. Like, let's talk about it. Why did you choose to do that? And like, how do you know that that affected me? And you know, it's like a restorative conversation. How can we, you know, make sure that we're all, we're cool with each other at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. Some lavender while we talk about yeah. this. Right. Yeah. Conversation. Beautiful. Love that you're in deep. So we have another question is, what is emotional behavioral behavior disorder? Um, we have a couple of questions to link to this. How does someone receive diagnosis with this disorder? How might they present? And what are some services they will benefit from? So I would just go back. The, what is emotional behavior disorder? Yeah, so EBD is a, you know, a disability category through IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, right? So it's how someone gets an IEP. Like, what do they qualify for special education under? Um, so they, there's some, like some, uh, they have to have criteria. a certain set of criteria that they have to meet, and it has to be at least one out of the following, and I'll read them. But it's important to know that they have to show it to a marked degree, which means it has to be fairly significant, and it has to affect their educational performance. So it can't just be, you know, something that, like, someone from home comes in and says they tantrum all the time at home, and they're showing all these things, but you're not seeing it at school. Like, that would not qualify them for an IP. So it has to be, like, affecting school. Um, so they have to struggle with learning, and it can't be explained by an intellectual, sensory, or a health factor struggling to build or maintain meaningful interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers. Um, given normal or typical circumstances, they exhibit unmatched behavior or feelings. Um, a general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression, a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems. So that sometimes can be like school refusal, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to show at least one of those. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's normally more than that. Like, if you're going to show one of those, you're probably going to show more than that, right? That's what I was thinking when I heard that list. I was like, this sounds like one person. Right. And it usually is, you know. Um, but, I mean, if you're just, like, really refusing to come to school and that's become a problem, but you're not really showing other things, like, once you finally get there, you could still maybe qualify because it's affecting your school performance, right? So sometimes there's things that are only, you know, or they're really – they have severe depression and it's affecting – school, right? Oh, wow. But you're not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they present so many different ways, but sometimes um, people will say they're either an externalizer or an internalizer. So kids that completely like hold into themselves almost. And sometimes you see that with like select mutism and stuff. Right. Um, you know, kids that like, they just totally withdraw. And then the kids that are externalizers, which we all know what that is. Like just, you see the behavior, you hear them down the hallway. Yes. yes. Yeah can be often aggressive verbally or physically. And then services, obviously they would be receiving special education services. And then uh, it really depends on the kid. You know, it depends. It depends. Sometimes they have sensory needs that would be helped by an OT. Sometimes that's not present. Um, I've had a lot of students that have the primary diagnosis of EBD that also get speech and then usually social work. Um, Is that but right? actually during the domain their um, emotions and that's why they're acting out this way right so social work is pretty obvious that that would be a related service but I see a lot of kids that get speech because they have such a hard time just articulating how they're feeling so it's a lot of like social pragmatics like mm -hmm. we're having a hard time and then I, I had a student that had the most difficult time with word finding and we think that that's like sort of how this all stemmed from was like he just could never figure out how to get out what he was trying to say. And it was all word finding. Like wow. he'd be sitting there and he's like, I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, and you're like watching him and want to almost fill in the words. You're like, I know what you're trying to say, but right. I want you to say it, but he just couldn't get there. And it was so frustrating for him. I can imagine. Man, yeah. Yeah. Like that's exhausting. Just thinking about it. So, and then, um, 
Our last so, question. <laughs> do you think that sometimes kids act out just to act out, or do you believe there is always an underlying issue? So I operate just on the belief that all behavior is communication. So I, that's why I think behavior also and speech are so tied together because they're trying to get something out. And so we'd rather have them use appropriate, you know, actual words to be able to do that um, rather than the many, the multitude of ways that they often do. Um, but I just truly believe there's like no kid that's going to come to speech or math or recess just to be impossible for the sake of being impossible. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's all for a reason. And for some kids, I think it's really hard to find it, which mm -hmm. is why it looks like they're just doing it to be a pain. Uh -huh. But that's, that doesn't mean they're doing it just to be a pain. There's a reason it's just harder to find. So relationship building is just so important. So you can eventually get to that root issue. And sometimes it takes a long time. So it, that's why it's so hard to work with kids that have behavioral issues. You have to be really patient. So yeah. Right. right. And I don't think there is any issue with using speech therapy sessions in order to build rapport. And like, there is no timeline on that. So right. Right. people who are like, oh, I need to work on these goals. It's like, well, you're not going to accomplish anything with these goals. If you don't uh, target this behavior first. Right. So stop right. rushing into it. Right. I, we brought that up. We had an episode about behavior and um, mm -hmm saying it's a foundation skill but it's also like a prerequisite to like right you know, yes and then even if it is like sitting or other example or not shouting before you could talk about i don't know l in the initial position right right so <laughs> right like i also need you to be like attending here you know i need you to be able to be willing to participate in this yeah i mean that's true with with anything right you you need participation so to get there sometimes it takes five sessions of us just like hanging out and you finding out I'm not going to be mean or rude right. to you or force you to do something you don't want to do, you know? Right. And there's data you could take in that session anyway, too. Yeah. So. Right. Because you can have a conversation, any type of back and forth where right. you're answering any questions. Lots of kids have goals, like we'll recall, um, at personal events. Right. So you could talk about their birthday party or something. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Or what did you watch on TV last night? Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There you go. I took a PD the other day on mental health and the person brought up something very interesting that like many times, many times individuals of all ages, they may act out because they feel like the majority of their life is outside of their control or chaotic and they don't have control, whether it's like a very disorganized adult or a child that feels like they're constantly being bossed around. So many of these individuals will act out, like throw a chair, punch something, break something, because that's the situation when they finally have control. Because now that they're tantruming, like tantruming in the classroom, now everything's stopped. They're, they're hitting and choosing what they choose to do. They have complete control over the situation. And now the the adults in charge is going to remove them. So it's like where they're, they're just kind of like seeking control because they feel out of control. Oh, I see. Right. So it's one of those things you just have to see, okay, so what is it that you need? Okay, I got it. Like, then let's find a healthy way to be able to do that. It's just another way of thinking about replacement behaviors, but in a more like abstract way than sometimes I think we normally think about it. Normally we're thinking like, oh, the kid's always like flapping their arms. Okay, let's find another way to get, but this is the same idea. It's just, we don't always think about it through that mindset, but it really is the same thing. Right, that's an excellent point. So uh, at this point we have our tips or tricks segment. So this is a tip or trick that can be implemented as soon as like tomorrow. It doesn't require purchasing or prepping, just something practical and doable. <laughs> Do you want right. to go first or should we go first? Yes. So for relationship building, this is a strategy that is like research proven. If you look it up, you'll find a bunch of stuff about it. It's a two times 10 strategy. Mm -hmm. And um, so it means that for two minutes a day for 10 days, you are just talking to the student about something that they care about. What like their, it's their direction. So it can be a little harder for an SLP because you likely don't see the same kid every day, but Right. You know, if you're in one building, you could, if you're going to go grab another kid from that same class, you could come in two minutes earlier and chat with somebody or right, yeah. um, go out to recess or pop into lunch for two minutes, you know, and just say hi and chat with them. And there is a lot of research that says that at the end of those 10 days of just two minutes of the kid being able to direct the conversation and talk to you about 
whatever they choose, um, that relationships really do start to form out of that. So yeah. kind of a cool, yeah, that's quick idea. I like that. Yeah. Also, two times they, ten. you can like, when you pick up a kid, let's say like the minute they stand up out of class and are walking with you, like you have that, those two minutes as it takes to walk from your speech room to your, wherever you're treating. Right. Um, not in the hallway. Uh, <laughs> Wherever you're We're treating. very anti-treating in the hallway. I, mean, I treat a little bit in the hallway, but I also have a room too, but I just needed a, an activity to move around. Well, so. so that's different. You're using right. your space like for your technique. Right. Sometimes yes. I do speech in the hallway because we have so I tell them to walk like humans. Exactly. <laughs> I always tell them that I'm like, right. walk like a civilized human. Not an sometimes they'll be, oh, they'll be like skipping or like, I don't know what they're doing. I just know. silly ro rolling through the hallway. Right. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> so yeah. Um, my tip or trick is, um, so, uh, I wanted to bring up another thing that I learned at that PD because I think this mm -hmm. is something that I have been thinking about when you talked about uh, internalizing and externalizing, there's like four major, um, mental health issues that I feel like we're constantly talking about where, so like internalizing would be like anxiety or depression. That's where like the pain is felt inside and like, maybe there isn't any type of like outward expression of it so outward. much um it's just the pain is hidden so knowing that there could be something happening internally even though you don't see externalized behaviors and something that like two examples of things that are externalized are adhd and ocd because you are seeing those behaviors uh -huh. um take place outside of the body so yeah. uh, my tip or trick is just to be mindful just like how ali said like regardless like no one's really just trying to be a pain and a lot mm -hmm. of times it's outside of their control so try to examine the whole human and think about like how can you just alleviate whatever situation that you have being mind mindful and open-minded cool i love it i'm a little good i'm gonna cheat a little bit only because i was inspired by this episode so <laughs> i think uh my tip or trick is to play like a little game like guess that smell so if you have like different essential oils or just something that smells and like cover it and have them like smell it and then guess and then like compare it. So like a sniff test, I feel right. like that could be a fun activity, even if it's just like a segue into what you're doing. Like if you have like right. color markers and color uh, cover, like the name of the scent and have them smell like blueberry and lemon, like, oh, you you guess lemon. All right, well, that means we're going to color this. And you, like, go right into what you want to work on. But just to incorporate smell, like, in that sense, to have them, like, inferencing and, you know, just thinking outside the box. Or yeah. even voting, which one they like. Oh, yeah, voting. voting is I like cool. voting. Because then it also makes them feel like they have a say. Yeah. Voice is heard. I feel like a lot of kids, I think it's hard to be a kid because you're constantly at the mercy of adults. <laughs> so, um, like, you, right. you eat when they say, you right. go to the bathroom when they say, right. you learn what they tell you to. So, it's, like, really hard to be a kid. So, it's just nice to do something that empowers them. Agreed. And now, we finally like to end with a quote, something that's inspirational to you, if you uh, would care to share with us yes. a quote that you like. Sure. So, it kind of goes off of uh, a question that you asked, and... So that is kids do well if they can. So that's from Dr. Ross Green, who um, is one of my favorite people to follow regarding behavior. Um, he's written a lot of books and he has a really cool organization, but his main quote is kids do well if they can. So that basically just tells us that um, they have missing skills if they're not behaving in a way that's, you know, we deem positive. Um, yeah. So we need to teach to those skills just like you would anything, like you would articulation, like you would addition, like you would, I mean, writing, like you got to explicitly teach some stuff that they're missing. So, right. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank Great. you so much Thanks. for doing this episode. You have been a wealth of knowledge, so we really do appreciate. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, so, fun. yeah, we're going to end the episode, um, but then don't leave this meeting because I want to take a picture before. <laughs> Perfect. But, so. yeah, so everyone, thanks for listening, and stay tuned to our next episode of SLP's Wine and Cheese. I'm Deb. And I'm Maria. And, and I'm Allie. Thank you, Allie. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.